So hello everybody. Um, good morning from Melbourne. My name is uh, Declan Murphy, a urologist and director of GU Oncology here at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to co-host uh, this um, uh, a very special PCF uh, webinar, uh, global webinar this morning. Uh, today fo focusing on uh, PSMA lutetium theranostics and in particular the therapy uh, randomized trial which was recently uh, presented at ASCO. Uh, I'm joined here um, in our little studio at Peter Mac by my colleague uh, Professor Michael Hoffman, nuclear medicine physician uh, at Peter Mac, uh, who will be presenting the paper this morning um, and also by our esteemed panel joining us on Zoom. You can see them on the slide that Michael's sharing. Uh, we have Professor Wolfgang uh, Weber, nuclear medicine specialist uh, from the Technical University of München, München, Germany. Uh, Professor Ian Davis, uh, co-PI uh, on this trial, uh, who is the uh, chair of ANZUP, the clinical trial cooperative we have here in Australia and New Zealand, who led this uh, trial, medical oncologist, uh, and by Professor Cora Sternberg, uh, from uh, medical oncologist uh, from Weill Cornell uh, in New York, joining us. Uh, and as we hand over to Michael, he'll tell us uh, all about the number of you that are out there uh, uh, watching this webinar this morning, and he will encourage you to um, uh, uh, ask us questions and how you go about doing that so we can have a very interactive discussion, not just with the panel, but with you uh, as registrants. Uh, I'm going to hand over um, to uh, Dr. Howard Sewell uh, from the PCF, from the Prostate Cancer uh, Foundation. Howard, very, known, very well known to very many of you. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Science Officer uh, at the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and it's thanks to the PCF that we're running this webinar this morning. Uh, Howard, over to you. Thank you very much, Declan. It's... Uh, a pleasure to co-host our second um, Theranostics webinar um, from Peter Mac and around the world. Um, our foundation is focused entirely on um, preventing death and suffering for patients with advanced prostate cancer and feel that this Theranostics program, as well as many that you will hear about today, are rapidly moving us in the right direction uh, for patients. Uh, it's with particular um, gratitude that I now introduce um, Professor Hoffman from, from the Peter Mac, a nuclear medicine physician who is known to many of you, who really has uh, spearheaded a lot of this cutting edge science uh, translated into now treatments and, and improved imaging for patients with advanced prostate cancer. So thanks for this opportunity to share your work with the world, um, Michael, and we look forward to hearing about the therapy trial. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Declan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have 623 registrants from over 40 countries, which is quite impressive. It's uh, just on 6 a.m. here in Melbourne, and I think it's 10 p.m. in Germany, so some people are doing this in their pyjamas. Uh, there's almost 300 participants online at the moment that I can see. Uh, and uh, this is a breakdown of uh, where people are from. This is actually from last night, so it's a little bit out of date. But interestingly, mostly nuclear medicine specialists online. That's unusual. That never happens. Uh, a lot of industry representatives, medical oncology, and uh, a good number of researchers, urologists, radiologists, and uh, people from other backgrounds, including nursing, which is great to see. Uh, now, we do want this to be interactive, so if you... Uh, hover down on your taskbar. If you click on Q&A, you can then enter a question and everyone will be able to see your question and then people can upvote your question just like on Facebook and uh, we will answer the most highly voted questions first and go down the list. Uh, so please uh, post your questions. And, and we do have a poll. Uh, I'm going to start with a poll. Uh, we'd like everyone to vote. So we're going to talk about the therapy study and there's a little bit of uncertainty about terminology. I never know what the right term is. So we treated men with prostate cancer with high PSMA expression on a PSMA PET with uh, lutetium PSMA. And the question is, what term do you prefer for this type of procedure? And the options are molecular radiotherapy, molecular targeted radiotherapy, radioligand therapy, radionuclide therapy, and uh, uh, theranostics. And there's 294 people voting. We might just give everyone another few seconds to vote and then I'll, uh, I'll show you the answers. I'll give you a hint. There's no correct answer to this question. Uh, uh, and it just give, w lets you work out how the uh, voting works as well. 
77% of people have cast a vote. We might end the polling there and show the results. So most people like theranostics, uh, followed closely by radionuclide therapy. Uh, that's interesting. We did this poll on, uh, on Twitter the other day and uh, we got similar results actually. 37% on the Twitter poll like theranostics as the preferred term. All right, so uh, this is the therapy study. Uh, I'm going to run through the ASCO presentation. For those that have seen the ASCO presentation, you can listen to it again or go off and have a coffee. This is going to take about 10 or 15 minutes and then each of the panel members will give us some uh, commentary, which I'm really interested to listen to. Uh, so the therapy study was an investigator-initiated study run by the ANZUP Cancer Trials Group, a cooperative uh, clinical trials group in Australia that uh, Ian Davis leads. Uh, it was a phase two study comparing uh, lutetium theranostics to carbazitaxel in men with metastatic castration-resistant disease progressing after uh, docetaxel. Uh, Metastatic-resistant, castration-resistant prostate cancer needs no introduction to this audience, uh, so I'll run through this slide quickly. We have uh, several life-prolonging therapies. In this trial, we chose carbazitaxel as the control arm. Uh, this is a drug that has a proven overall survival benefit compared to both mitoxantrone and more recently in the New England Journal of Medicine last year that Cora on the line is a co-author of a, a survival advantage compared to a second-line crossover anti-androgen therapy. Uh, and this is in men with docetaxel-resistant MCRPC. The experimental arm is obviously lutetium PSMA 617, a small molecule that's radioactive that binds to PSMA, uh, enabling delivery of high doses of beta irradiation to sites of tumours. Uh, lutetium 177 has a one millimetre path length and a seven day half life. Uh, the short path length means that we uh, irradiate tumours but have very limited damage to normal soft tissues. Uh, encouraging efficacy and safety has been demonstrated in a, an array of non-randomised clinical trials, initially out of uh, Germany, uh, from both Munich and uh, Heidelberg, uh, as a compassionate access therapy, and then a little more recently from our Peter Mac Phase 2 data, where we showed a PSA response over 50% in 64% of men. It was really the early results of our experience here at Peter Mac, after we had probably enrolled 10 to 15 patients on our trial, that we got together with ANZUP uh, to make this proposal and thankfully the ANZUP team you know, helped us design the trial and therapy really is the first randomised trial comparing lutetium PSMA to an active therapy, carbazitaxel. Uh, the aim was to determine the activity and safety of lutetium compared to carbazitaxel. All men progressed on docetaxel. They had rising PSA using prostate cancer working group and also a PSA over 20. Uh, so these were no men without you know, really small volumes of disease, but more higher volume disease. Once men were suitable, then they all underwent a PSMA and FDG PET scan. And we'll show you how that worked in a subsequent slide. Randomised to lutetium PSMA 617, uh, six cycles or carbazitaxel at 20 milligrams per metre squared, up to 10 cycles. Randomisation at 11 sites, hospital sites around Australia, 200 men stratified by disease burden prior enzalutamide or abiraterone or study site. Study was powered to detect a 20% absolute improvement in the lutetium arm, so from 40% from carbazitaxel to 60%. Men in the lutetium arm underwent uh, SPECT-CT imaging after each cycle of therapy, and that uh, uh, in, if there was a complete response, men paused and then could be retreated upon progression as part of the trial. We registered 291 suitable men who underwent the PET-CT scans, randomised 200, 100 in each arm. This was a non-blinded study. There were more withdrawals in the carbazitaxel arm with 16 patients not receiving the treatment to which they were assigned carbazitaxel in that arm versus only one patient in the lutetium arm. The primary analysis, however, was an intention to treat analysis and we have also performed a sensitivity analysis for per protocol. Just looking at these 91 ineligible patients on PSMA FDG PET, 10% uh, had low PSMA expression at all sites, whereas an additional 18% had adequate PSMA expression, but then sites of uh, what we call discordant disease, uh, which are sites of FDG-positive PSMA-negative disease, like we see in the liver 
uh, on this patient. So in total, uh, roughly 30% of men were deemed ineligible on PSMA FDG PET. These were all subject to set central review. We had a panel of three experts that reviewed these. Uh, that was done using a web-based platform. And we also had strict quality control through the Australian Radio Pharmaceutical Trials Network, where all sites had to complete uh, PET validation and radio tracer validation prior to commencement. Uh, we did use quantitative PET parameters to determine suitability. So you must have had an SUV max, that's the standardised uptake value over 20 at a site of disease, SUV over 10 at sites of measurable soft tissue disease, and then no sites of FDG positive, PSMA negative, discordant disease. Uh, so some men had high FDG uptake, but as long as there was high PSMA expression at all sites, they were eligible. Our primary endpoint was PSA response, defined using prostate cancer working group criteria, a reduction of 50% or more from baseline. And the secondary endpoints reported at ASCO last week were PSA progression-free survival and adverse events. Our other secondary endpoints await further follow-up and analysis. Our median age was 72 in each arm. 91% in each arm, or 91 men, uh, had progressed on pri prior enzalutamide or abiraterone ECOG performance status was fifty was one rather in fifty percent of patients, and fifty percent had a Gleason score of eight or more. Now this was an updated data set with a cutoff thirty one March twenty twenty, and the primary endpoint showed that sixty six percent of men in the carbazitax rather in the lutetium arm sixty six percent in the lutetium arm had a PSA response of fifty percent or more versus thirty seven percent in the carbazitax arm. So that's a 29% absolute greater PSA 50 response rate. Uh, quite a large difference with non-overlapping uh, confidence intervals, uh, highly significant. Uh, that's the intention to treat analysis in the sensitivity per protocol analysis. This difference was 23%. Uh, that accounts for these patients that were not treated in the arm to which they were randomised. The first secondary endpoint, which is a preliminary readout, is PSA progression-free survival. This was based on 157 of the required pre-planned 170 events to an statistically analyse this uh, with high confidence. And to date, we show a hazard ratio of 0.69 uh, favouring lutetium PSMA. At the time of analysis, there were 71 deaths in total, and that was insufficient to perform any sort of survival analysis at present. Adverse events. Overall, we saw... Grade 3 or 4 adverse events in 54% of men in the carbazitaxel arm compared to 35% of men who received lutetium PSMA. Now, this is not attributed to drug. This, uh, these are all AEs. Uh, so there were less AEs in the lutetium PSMA arm. If we run through these uh, briefly, we see neutropenia or febrile neutropenia in 13% of men, grade 3, 4, uh, receiving carbazitaxel compared to 4% with lutetium PSMA. We had no episodes of febrile neutropenia with lutetium compared to 8% uh, with carbazitaxel, more diarrhea, change in taste and neuropathy uh, with carbazitaxel as expected, and more uh, thrombocytopenia with a G34 of 10%, uh, more dry mouth, grade 1, 2 exclusively, 59%, and dry eyes, 30% uh, with lutetium. Uh, only one man uh, stopped treatment due to toxicity in the lutetium arm, and there were no lutetium PSMA-related deaths. Now, so the strengths of this study is that it's the first randomised study. Uh, we used an active and clinically relevant control arm that Dr Sternberg will tell us a bit more about, given her experience in the CARD trial. Uh, we used molecular imaging to carefully select patients, showed a large difference in the primary endpoint. In terms of limitations, we really do await the results of other secondary endpoints, including radiologic, PFS, quality of life, overall survival. Uh, this was not blinded. There were more withdrawals in the carbazitaxel arm. The clinical interpretation is that lutetium PSMA is a novel class of radiopharmaceutical with high activity and relatively low toxicity. Uh, results con largely consistent with prior phase 2 data, no new toxicities identified. Uh, I think the data suggests that it may represent an alternative and perhaps a favourable treatment option compared to carbazitaxel in this select population with high PSMA expression. Importantly, we don't yet define an improvement in overall survival, and we also await the results of the Phase 3 vision trial as sponsored by AAA Endocyte Novartis. 
Uh, the results also suggest that lutetium PSMA warrant study in earlier phases of prostate cancer or in combination with other therapies. So in conclusion, in men with progressive disease following docetaxel, lutetium PSMA was more active and with relatively fewer G3 to 4 severe adverse events and a progression-free survival for PSA favouring lutetium PSMA. And we think this represents a, a potential new class of effective therapy for men with MCRPC. There's lots of people to thank for this study, so I'll just take a moment to do that. Uh, this study was designed and conducted by the ANZUP uh, Collaborative Clinical Trials Group uh, in collaboration with the NH and MRC Clinical Trials Centre at the University of Sydney that did all the central uh, data collection, CRO, and also the Australian Radio Pharmaceuticals Trials Network, uh, who put together all the molecular imaging aspects of this trial. Uh, PSMA 617 Supply, that was from Endocyte, now a Novartis company, and they also provided us with some financial support for this study. Lutetium 177 uh, came from ANSTO. Actually, the final product was made in hospital radiopharmacies at each of those 11 sites. Uh, the study was funded by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, uh, and I'm supported by a Peter Mac Clinical Fellowship. Uh, we thank really all the patients and their support networks, all the PIs uh, that are listed in this slide in this network uh, across Australia that have all done an absolutely fantastic job of really running this uh, investigator academic study at a really high level. Uh, so we thank everyone. And uh, pause there for a second. We have 12 questions and we'll come to those. I might hand back to, to Declan. Thank you, Michael. Um, so thank you for reprising this es excellent uh, ASCO uh, presentation from last week. And just to clarify, the paper is not out yet because you're waiting for some more events so you can report the rest of the endpoints. So we're having a, an early uh, journal club on this one. We don't have the full paper yet, but we, we all feel this data is interesting. We've been waiting for a prospect of randomized data in the space. So we're very, very interested in hearing the panel views and hearing your views. So just to remind you, the best way to engage is using the questions rather than the chat function on Zoom. Uh, and if you want to put your question in or look at questions other people have put in, you can vote them up and down, and that's what will get our attention as we run through them uh, once we have a chat with the panel. So let's pop over to our panel now, and I'd first like to invite uh, Cora, uh, Professor Cora Sternberg, uh, medical oncologist at Wheel Cornell, very well known to all of us working in advanced prostate cancer, uh, to give us her perspective um, uh, on this trial. Uh, Cora, over to you. Thank you very much, Declan and Michael and Howard for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the therapy trial uh, and put it in comparison to the CARD trial in which I was a, a part of the steering com committee and I participated in that trial as well. Next. So the CARD trial uh, was for patients with metastatic CRPC. And the, the selection was different from the therapy trial. We did select, it was a third line trial, but we selected patients who progressed within 12 months of a prior androgen receptor targeted agent, which was either abiraterone or enzalutamide. And they all had um, docetaxel as well. Patients were randomized between cabazitaxel 25 milligrams per meter squared, different yeah. dosage than on the therapy trial. Okay, can you hear me? And, uh, and a GCSF with prednisone twice a day and randomized against abiraterone and prednisone or enzalutamide depending uh, which um, ARTA they had received before. The primary endpoint was radiologic progression-free survival and key secondary endpoint was overall survival. Can I have the next please? So this is the um, data um, the radiologic progression-free survival, which was our primary endpoint. And you can see that cabazitaxel more than doubled radiologic progression-free survival as compared to abiraterone or enzalutamide. Next. And this is the overall survival. And here we can see that cabazitaxel reduced the risk of death by 36% as again, as compared to abiraterone or enzalutamide. Next. Now, in terms of PSA, we know very well that PSA is a biomarker of androgen receptor signaling. And, but however, metastatic CRPC, we know also is highly heterogeneous and that disease progression doesn't only depend on, on having cells that are AR dependent. It's, there are also AR independent mechanisms of progression. We have the next. So 
So this is a paper that we re recently published on the PREVAIL data, which was a study of enzalutamide that was given uh, for patients with metastatic CRPC before they had received uh, dose of taxol. These were patients primarily that were asymptomatic. And they, these are patients with radiologic progression and a valuable PSA on enzalutamide. And you can see from this trial that some 25, go back, some 25% of the patients that actually did not have a rising PSA. So PSA monitoring is clearly not enough and regular imaging is needed during treatment. So we're selecting in the therapy trial a different group of patients that are selected for having a PSMA positive scans. And you can see how things can be different depending on, on what you're looking at exactly. May I have the next? So again, you know well the mechanism of action of the taxanes, and taxanes work both um, on AR-dependent and AR-independent uh, cells, but some from preclinical models, they suggest that cabazitaxel mainly acts by AR-independent pathways, not so much on AR-dependent pathways. May I have the next? And Another point is that inflammation and tumor-associated neutrophils promote tumor growth, angiogenesis, and invasion. And we know that neutropenia induced by chemotherapy has consistently been, go back, associated, go back, go back, please, associated with, with improved survival. Next, next, <laughs> you're going the wrong direction. Next slide, please. So do, this is um, two studies on docetaxel. My goodness, go back, please. Go back, please. Michael, can you go back? Michael, can you go back, please, one second? Thank you. So docetaxel, um, these are two different trials, one of which is the TAX-327 trial that we're all very familiar with, another one from China showing that severe neutropenia has, was associated with better overall survival. There's the patients with grade three or more neutropenia treated with docetaxel. Next slide, please. We also know from the tropic trial, the cabazitaxel induced grade three neutropenia was associated with prolonged progression-free survival and overall survival in this post hoc analysis of patients on the tropic trial. May I have the next please? And these are just some final thoughts. The patients in the CARD trial were less selected for PSA or PSMA uh, as in the therapy trial where we heard that some 30% were not eligible for the trial. The response rate to cabazitaxel is similar in the two trials. It was 36% confirmed response in CARD and 37% in the therapy trial. PSA 50 is not a validated sur surrogate endpoint for overall survival. Cabazitaxel will be generic in one year in Europe. The PSMA PET still requires FDA approval and we know nothing about the cost as yet. And neutropenia may well portend increased overall survival. We clearly need therapies for our patients with metastatic CRPC and lutetium PSMA 617 is certainly very promising. And these results are extremely exciting. And we all do look forward to the vision trial results. And I'd like to congratulate the authors on the therapy trial. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Cora, for that excellent overview uh, of Cabazitaxel active in this space, of course. And we'd now like to go to Ian Davis, Professor Ian Davis, uh, co-chair uh, of this trial and chair of the ANZUP uh, clinical trial group um, uh, that supported this trial. And we've asked Ian specifically to discuss this um, endpoint issue around using PSA as an endpoint. And uh, Cora has very nicely set up the landscape for you, Ian. Over to you. Thank you, Declan, um, and thank you for the questions on, on this point. There have been a few that have come up in the chat, um, looking at uh, PSA 50% response rates as opposed to radiographic progression-free survival. And also someone has asked, why did we, this is Gianluca Dianarini, why did you choose PSA-related endpoints rather than radiographic endpoints, probably more reliable in the MCRPC landscape? Uh, so I'll just remind you that eligibility for this uh, trial included rising PSA. So we already knew that PSA was still, at least in some respects, a uh, valid marker for progressive disease in these patients, whether it correlated with response was something that we, uh, we, we yet to find out. And 
so the, the reasons why we chose this endpoint of uh, the PSA 50% reduction rate uh, was firstly and, and probably foremost, it was a pragmatic endpoint. We knew that the events would occur quickly and we needed to get an answer quite quickly. But there was also prior experience with uh, Lutetium PSMA suggesting that uh, this endpoint did correlate with response. And Michael might want to comment on that. That was a paper that came out of, of Peter McCallum. We knew in other settings also that this endpoint correlated with overall survival uh, in the setting of docetaxel or AR signaling inhibitor and in that I also include abiraterone uh, or lutetium PSMA and I'll put a reference up there and the figure on the on the right side of the screen which you probably can't read uh, comes from Andy Armstrong's analysis of the prevail data showing the survival curves based on the depth of the PSA response and so if you had a deeper PSA response then it's um, uh, seem to correlate with overall survival. And I'll just point you to a great uh, review actually published a couple of years ago um, by Scott Williams, uh, who is the chair of the ANZA Prostate Cancer Subcommittee and the global co-chair of the ENZA RAD study, uh, which is uh, still in follow-up. Can you just go to the um, next slide, please? Happy to take more questions on this point uh, uh, later. Uh, just while I have the microphone, um, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about ANZUP Cancer Trials Group. ANZUP is the Australian and New Zealand Urogenital and Prostate Cancer Trials Group. It's very important to have an acronym that you can pronounce. Uh, we have around about 1,800 members across Australia, New Zealand, and internationally. Uh, and we look at all gender urinary cancers, although not gynecological cancers. So prostate, kidney, urothelial, uh, non-urothelial bladder cancers, uh, testicular cancer and penile cancer. Uh, the structure of the organisation is shown there on the right and at the bottom of the screen are our subcommittees. We have four disease specific subcommittees, prostate cancer, germ cell, renal cell and bladder, urothelial and penile. And we have two subcommittees that cross all of these disciplines um, involving translational research and quality of life and supportive care. And we try to build endpoints related to, to those issues into each of our trials. The slides seem to have disappeared there. Um, we also have a scientific advisory committee, which is uh, constituted to be a multidisciplinary uh, group. Uh, slide's gone, but we, you had an, um, an, uh, an idea there of some of the studies that are currently active. The ones in black are closed, but in follow-up, but uh, we've got clinical trials going on across all of those indications. I'll hand back to you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. That's a great overview of that. For why we chose the primary endpoint and also uh, a good overview of ANZUP and really ANZUP were critical to the success of this study. It really would have never occurred without uh, ANZUP, so we're really uh, very grateful. And now I'll hand over to uh, Wolfgang Weber in Germany for uh, maybe a little bit of a German perspective. I think, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be on this call here. Um, so first of all, I would like to point out that for nuclear medicine, this is really a landmark clinical trial because it's the first randomized clinical trials that demonstrate the activity of targeted radionuclide therapy or theranostics, as some people prefer, compared to an active chemotherapy in a common tumor type. I mean, there have been some trials that had showed the palliative effect. Uh, they were not randomized. Um, and uh, so it's really a milestone now uh, to see a, a perspective randomized clinical trials that shows the activity of this PSMA targeted uh, therapy in patients with prostate cancer. Uh, and since this therapy is a completely new paradigm uh, for treating prostate cancer, I think it's also a significant step uh, for the therapy of patients with advanced prostate cancer. What I also would like to point out that I think it is also an, an there's also an aspect of this study that is really uh, advancing this whole concept of precision or personalized medicine. And this is to use imaging for patient selection uh, and to use imaging not only to identify differences between patient or interpatient heterogeneity, but also intermetastatic heterogeneity. Next. Can I have the next slide? And this is a little bit what I want to, to, to um, what I mean by that is, 
that um, the, if you think about how precision medicine is practiced right now, it, it has one fundamental limitation. I mean, we all have seen those cartoons that we have different patients in different colors that get different pills. And this, this is based on some omics based, genomics based, or uh, other analysis based uh, testing. But I think the, the fundamental limitation is there that you basically reduce every patient to a kind of test tube. And you have one result for this tumor and for this patient that is used to guide therapy. It is really this one test of the tumor tissue. So all the spatial information, all the information about heterogeneity between different sites of disease within a patient is lost by this kind of analysis. And I think what the, the therapy trial also showed is, and that is really showed for the first time, that this heterogeneity on imaging studies, in this case, the difference between FTG PET and PSME PET, can be used in the clinical trial to actually select patients and to identify patients that are most likely to benefit and uh, from this from this uh, from this intervention, so it, it basically shows if you if you remain with this cartoon that there are not only this green and yellow and, and blue patients, but also patients that are a mix of yellow and green and blue, and this is only information that can be provided by by this imaging test. Next, next. So, like every good research, uh, the therapy trial raises more questions than than it answers. And, and I've grouped those questions here between uh, questions related to the, to the methods and then some questions more about the clinical application of the PSMA targeted radionuclear therapy. I think one question, um, I think there were also some questions already in the, in the, in the Q, Q, Q and A. Uh, this is about the exclusion criteria. And I think for very good reason, the thera therapy trial used very stringent criteria to identify patients really to maximize the chance to get a positive signal if this PSMA target radionuclide therapy is active in patients with advanced prostate cancer. I think this is a very good and reasonable start. Uh, but it also, of course, led them to the exclusion of about one third uh, of, uh, of, the, of the patients. And the question is certainly now, uh, are less stringent uh, exclusion criteria feasible? And uh, is, is the disease then still, uh, act, uh, is the therapy then still active? Um, related to this, and this more a really technical question is basically, uh, what is the optimal quantitative SUV criteria? I mean, I think an SUV of 20 or 10, I think, is a good starting point. But I think future research needs then to, to, to put a more uh, data-based uh, uh, approach. What is the best uh, uh, cutoff value to identify patients likely or unlikely to benefit? And I think also um, an important question is how many cycles of therapy uh, should be administered. I think it's one interesting approach uh, to stop treatment or pause treatment if there's an excellent response. But you could also make the, the opposite argument and say it's important to continue in these patients to make the, make the response last longer, especially since the side effect profile was, was quite favorable. So I think that's also an open question and, and needs to be addressed in future studies. In the clinical side, I think it's very reassuring that this trial again shows that uh, PSMA 617 treatment short term is quite safe. Uh, we still need more data, I think, on the more long term toxicity, especially when we want to move this treatment into earlier stages uh, of prostate cancer. And I think clinically, um, now the really exciting part is um, to talk about not single agent therapy, but, but also combinations. Again, the side effect profile, I think, makes this uh, feasible. And there are, of course, several things uh, to consider, anti androgen external beam radiotherapy, checkpoint inhibitors, PARP inhibitors, that could all, I think, potentially combine with uh, this PSMA targeted, targeted therapy. And then the maybe most exciting question remains, how early uh, can we use PSMA 617 therapy? Uh, we started with a very uh, late advanced stage uh, group of patients in, in division trial. Now the therapy trial is a little bit earlier com compared to, to patients that didn't have uh, received the second line chemotherapy. Uh, but I think because of the side effect profile, it certainly seems po possible now the next logical step now to go to, e to even earlier stages of prostate cancer where the therapy and the duration of responses might be even longer. So again, I think it's a really great trial and a great pleasure to think about it and to ask these questions. And I'm looking forward now to the discussion uh, with, with all the panelists. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, uh, Cora, Ian, uh, for these excellent uh, perspectives. So I'm going to hand over to Michael, who will now uh, take us Pick through some of muted. the questions. We're, uh, we're muted, Michael. Thank you. Can you? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Declan. Thank uh, you. Great questions, uh, Wolfgang. You actually 
we don't need the panellists because I think you got all the key questions there. But to give the audience a chance to participate, we might hand over to the audience and let answer some of their questions and then come back to your questions if not if they if they're not the same. Uh, so I've asked Neil Bander to ask his question. He's got the highest voted question. He did that last time when we did a pro PSMA webinar a few weeks ago. He had the most upvoted question. Very impressive to get that twice. So Neil's question, he's on mute. Uh, I don't know if you Neil, you can unmute yourself and ask you the question yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in the uh, patients that you've treated, you have basically two identifiable phenotypes. You have PSMA positive, FTG negative, and PSMA positive, FTG positive. So my question is, what was the proportion of each of those phenotypes in the uh, trial? And um, did you see differences in, in response? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we don't have the answers, but we do have the data. So all these PET scans were centrally collected since they were centrally read. And we actually prospectively read a whole variety of metabolic parameters, including SUV max. But we also did metabolic tumor volumes, both on the PSMA and the FDG and they have been put into the central database but have not yet been analysed. So we will be able to tell you the answer to that question uh, in the future. We did do that analysis on, to some extent, with our uh, 50 patient Peter Mac Phase two data, and FDG was uh, highly prognostic. In fact, probably the metabolic tumour volume on FDG was the most prognostic uh, parameter out of anything and the intensity of uptake on PSMA was also highly prognostic. So if you had high-intensity PSMA uptake, you did uh, better, uh, more lutetium PSMA going to the target. Uh, also, we'll have the data of the patients we didn't treat because once patients were registered, we have the FDG PSMA PETs of the patients we uh, excluded, and those patients were registered in the study. So although they were not randomised, uh, they did go on an active follow-up arm, so we know what pa what treatment those patients had, and we'll know what the PSA response rate to that treatment was, and we'll also have the hopefully the overall survival of that group. So we'll be able to do some interesting uh, analysis in the future. Most of those patients probably will have received cabazitaxel because that was what they were planned to receive um, at study entry. Next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, got 20 votes, dry mouth and dry mouths, grade one, two, irreversible or not. Uh, does anyone else want to comment on experience with that? Wolfgang, do you have experience with that? Yeah, I, we, in, in our experience in, in I think, about uh, 200 patients or, or 250 patients, uh, dry mouth as with, with lutetium has not really been a clinical problem. It, it's, in our experience, it's typically mild and it, it, it resolves uh, even with, with, with even after within the second or third treatment cycle. So I think that's the difference between the actinium PSMA and the, and the lutetium PSMA. Uh, so dry mouth is, is, is not, I think, a significant clinical risk here for the treatment. Yeah, that's my experience too. I think it's overrated, in fact. The grade one, two dry eyes, dry mouth is not a particular problem. Almost no treatment say, I, I want to stop treatment because my dry mouth is severe. It's usually very mild. I think in part uh, it's asking the patients, do you have a dry mouth? And they say, I have a little bit of dry mouth and you record a grade one toxicity. You say, does it bother you at all? They say, not not really at all. So it's really probably only 20, 30% of patients where the patients are coming to you saying, I have a, a dry mouth and it's, it's still not particularly uh, bothering them. It was interesting that 30% of men in this study have reported a grade one or two dry eyes. That's not. That's a higher number than we reported in our uh, phase two data. Uh, I'm just, I promoted James Buteau to the panel to ask a question, and then we're going to try and promote Louise Emmett to the panel to ask her question. So, James, do you want to ask your question? Yes, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Um, I want to know what did you do with the patients randomized to Lou PSMA who had a good response after six cycles? Uh, could they access more Lou PSMA? So in this study, the lutetium arm was limited to uh, six cycles of uh, lutetium PSMA 617. Uh, when they progressed after that, they really went on to 
the best standard of care at the centre they were at, at the physician's discretion. Uh, so they had not necessarily had carbazitaxel, so that was an option for many of these men. Uh, this was conducted in 11 hospital sites around Australia and lutetium PSMA was not available at those at most of those sites uh, as a compassionate access therapy. So I think for the majority of these men participating in the study, they could not access further lutetium beyond uh, six cycles, but they could access other therapies such as carbazitaxel. There is some off-trial uh, lutetium available in some fee-for-service uh, centres, so men could seek further cycles there, but I don't think that really happened because these were hospital sites. Uh, an exception would be our own site at Peter Mac. We were the highest recruiting site, and, and we did uh, make an expanded access lutetium available to these men who participated in this study and benefited and who we thought would have uh, benefit from further cycles. So there are some men in this study who have received up to nine cycles of therapy at, at our site. Uh, but I think uh, the bottom line is that nine cycles of therapy or six cycles of therapy in the study is not rate limiting. So I think future studies could look at uh, going beyond six cycles, uh, particularly in men that are benefiting. If you've got high volume disease, uh, there's probably no reason in the future to stop at uh, six cycles. I'm trying to promote Louise Emmett. Louise Emmett is from Sydney. She was a, a key co-investigator in this trial, the second highest recruiting site at St Vincent's in Sydney. And uh, Louise, can you hear us and ask ask your question? Hi there, Michael. Can you hear me? We can. Great. So my question is really uh, the difference you think with the vision trial and the therapy trial. Um, therapy did both PSMA and FDG at screening and vision uh, undertook a PSMA PET do you think that will have an impact on uh, the results of the two trials? Obviously, you can't say at the moment. What, what's your opinion? I think FDG is uh, it's it's very useful. Uh, I think in my experience, it's it's important. Uh, it's you can obviously do without it. Uh, you can look at the CT component of the scan carefully. So, for example, in that patient with liver metastases that were FDG positive, PSMA negative. You could argue that the FDG is not required. If you look at the CT carefully, you will see progressive liver lesions with low PSMA uptake, so you know the answer. However, within bone, uh, it's you cannot see these lesions in bone. So if you have FDG-positive PSMA lesions within bone, they are occult on the CT. You are blind to them. So I think that's the major use. And in my experience, around 50% of those discordant lesions are in within bone rather than liver or, or other soft tissue organs. So you do miss those patients. Uh, I think that is an important finding. It's highly prognostic. Uh, obviously, you performing FDG PET adds expense. My own view is that we are better off spending a little bit more money initially and carefully selecting patients, getting the most information possible than trying to treat everyone. The VISION trial is an 850-patient study. Uh, this therapy is a 200-patient study. That's a big difference. So I don't think it'll ultimately matter too much for the vision trial. They are, you know, adequately powered to answer these questions uh, without FDG PET. In our trial, being a 200 patient trial, if we had not done patient care careful patient selection, I think we would have risked a negative trial. Uh, by including all these other patients, our 200 pa patient trial would have been more like a 400 or a 450 patient trial, in my opinion, if we did not do careful selection. So I think it's a big benefit to carefully select patients. Uh, next question. Yehia Omar, I'm going to try to promote you to the panel so that you can ask your question. Uh, can you hear us? And if not, I'll just ask your question for you. Yehia? Your question is, was there an explanation as to why our patients fail on lutetium, even though they had high PSMA uptake. Are there any other clear factors that affect response besides PSMA uptake? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, I might get uh, Louise. Do you, do you have a suggestion for that one? Just need to turn on your microphone, get Louise to answer this one for me. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I, I think PSA response, um, other other factors other than PSMA. I think FDG uh, is a prognostic factor. 
factor and I think it, um, it might not have an effect on the PSA response as such, but it will certainly have an effect on the prolonged, how, how deep that response is, how long that response will be for. Um, I think tumour volume is very important. Uh, so certainly in all the studies that have been done, very high tumour volume makes it difficult um, for a patient to get a significant response. And I think we've found that across all the studies. Um, once you get a certain volume of disease, it can be difficult. I think for me, that's probably the biggest, the biggest predictor. Yeah, from my perspective, dose is critical. So if we do get more uh, dose into tumour, then uh, we generally do better with this therapy. It is, there is no magic here. Uh, we did not do dosimetry in this study, but we have done it in uh, other studies. I might just actually share... Uh, one of our slides. Uh, so in our 30 patient phase two study, we did three time point dosimetry on all our men with SPECT CT at 424 and 96 hours. And we could uh, develop these nice dose maps where we could see uh, radiation and uh, delivery to both normal tissues and uh, tumours. And what we saw is that if you received uh, less than 10 gray uh, average dose to all of tumour, your chance of a PSA response was actually quite low. Uh, 10 non-responders and one responder if you received less than 10 graded tumour uh, versus uh, much more responders. This was defined by a PSA response over 50% if you got above 10 gray. So I think the answer there lies in dosimetry. Uh, but there are some people like this outlier over here who received a very high dose to tumour, uh, but despite that did not respond. So some patients have a very radio... Uh, resistant phenotype and no matter how much radiation we get into these tumours and uh, they don't respond. I think it'll be interesting to look at the genetics uh, of these men and then uh, uh, see whether there's any other factors. Uh, Wolfgang or, or Neil, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I would really agree that there are also other factors that affect response and those, of course, is important. But also, as your graphs show, there is it is um, um, significant scatter, and and I think there are other factors than those uh, that are important. And I think it's a great area of research to find out what those are. Neil, so you've I, done a lot of this work with J five nine one and antibodies. Any reflections? Well, I think uh, the other panelists have have covered the waterfront on this. I don't really have anything to add uh, other than I do have a question for you and Wolfgang and, and others, and that is, do you have a sense as to the advantages or disadvantages of a shorter and more intense course of, uh, of dosing versus a more protracted, less intense course? And, and which radiobiologically is more likely uh, to, to provide better survival? Wolfgang? I don't. I think it's a great question. I don't have the answer to it. Yeah, look, we've treated everyone as part of prospective clinical trials here at Peter Mac, and everyone we've used a six weekly cycling. Uh, so I can't answer that question. There is some data looking at uh, four weekly cycling in patients with high PSA kinetics. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, superior. I think six weeks is a uh, rational. It may be that uh, in some patients with a more aggressive phenotype, uh, four weekly cycles are better. It may be that in some patients with less aggressive disease, eight or 10 week cycles are better. Uh, the dosing regimen we used in this trial was unique. We started at 8.5 gigabecquerels of administered radioactivity for cycle one, and we decreased by 0.5 gigabecquerels for each cycle. So if you got to cycle six, you had six gigabecquerels. And we did that on the basis of our data from neuroendocrine tumors with lutetium showing a a sink effect and the suggestion there is that in patients with higher tumor burden you need a higher amount of radioactive peptide and uh, with a treatment where your disease responds perhaps you need uh, less administered activity with every cycle uh, but overall the dose is fairly similar to the 7.5 gigabecquerel that's used in the vision trial and I think if we had used a fixed administered activity of 7.5 gigabecquerels in this study I think the results would probably be uh, fairly similar. Next question is from Anders Obom. Obom, I might be pronouncing that wrong. I'm going to try to promote, uh, promote you to the panel if you would uh, like to speak and ask your question. Otherwise, 
Uh, I'll ask the question for you, but I think you, you can ask the question yourself. That'll be great. Anders. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, okay, so let me just bring up my question here. I forgot why I asked. Ah, oh, you forgot what you asked. I'll ask you. It was about uh, kidney toxicity. Yeah, so so in, in um, uh, the study so far, there's been quite a low level of kidney toxicity. Uh, but I'm wondering if it's, do you think that is just an effect that we, we, we haven't seen very long survival of treated patients yet, that there is something we might see uh, later on? Uh, and uh, uh, how should we, we, what lessons should we learn from, from the therapy of neuroendocrine tumors with lutetium dotatate? Because there have been several studies there that show that this 23 grade limit dose to the kidneys can, can uh, be um, exceeded without uh, negative effects in a lot of patients. So should we, yeah, it's, sort of from beginning with DSMA therapy, aim, try to, to, to see if we can give a higher dose to the kidneys and thereby a higher dose to the tumor. They're very good questions. So to date, all the trials in with lutetium PSMA have really been done in patients with a very poor prognosis and limited life expectancy. Uh, so we don't know in 10 years' time what the kidney function would look like. We don't have that data yet. Uh, in this population of MRCPC, I don't think kidney toxicity matters at all with lutetium PSMA. You know, we've treated a few hundred patients here at Peter Mac now, and nobody's gone into dialysis requiring renal failure or has renal toxicity been a particular problem. But in patients that have uh, had, so let's say, 10 cycles of lutetium here, we definitely do see a drop in GFR. Uh, it definitely does occur. So this may be of concern if you bring this treatment back to a first-line treatment and you give many cycles of therapy, you might find that at 10 years there was significant renal toxicity. I think the dosimetry data... Uh, may actually predict that. So I think we need to be cautious if we use this treatment uh, very early on. Uh, but in this trial, in the randomised compared to carbazitaxel, there was actually no greater renal toxicity with lutetium PSMA compared to carbazitaxel. Your other point was about a with lutetium dotatate for neuroendocrine tumours. Uh, and I think there are perhaps some on the line that don't appreciate that this whole field evolved from Atheronostics and neuroendocrine tumors using lutetium dotatate. Many of the uh, principles and the way we do this therapy from the uh, radiopharmaceutical aspects to the administration to the uh, dosimetry is exactly the same as uh, lutetium dotatate or lutathera, which is now FDA approved. And uh, at Peter Mac, we have a very large neuroendocrine tumor program, and that's where our PSMA program has really uh, grown out of. And, and we've never really believed in this 23 gray threshold. So there are Based on external beam radiation data, there's a theoretical limit of uh, 23 gray that you should not exceed in the liver, uh, in the kidneys rather, and many trials using lutetium uh, limit the dose to the kidneys uh, up to that 23 gray. Uh, I think we have overwhelming data that you can give much, much more than 23 gray to the kidney with lutetium and not have any problems. I don't know what that number is, but we have patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors that would have received 60 gray to kidneys by conventional dosimetry that have received 25 cycles of lutetium and you know and they're still not dying of renal failure so i don't think it's a particular uh, problem uh, yeah, thank look, you very much. great uh, and uh, i'm just going to people that are invited to the panel i'm just going to leave them in the panel uh louise emmett had another question so i'm going to go back to louise to ask her question louise are you there <laughs> yes. Um, so my other question was really about the FDG and the PSMA that was done together. Um, and I, I think that's really actually been a, a largely answered in a lot of the questions that were uh, gone over previously. So um, I might let someone else ask another very interesting question. Yeah, but all the all the PET scans in this study were, were centrally reviewed. Uh, Louise was part of that central review panel. And we, we used a system called WIDEN, uh, which is an Italian system where all the sites could up upload their PET scans and they were automatically anonymised by this system and the system actually performed a more automatic quality control check on the, uh, on the PET data and if there was an error, it picked that up and sent it back to sites and asked them to fix it uh, uh, and then it sent out an email to the panel to review and we were able to review most PETs within 24 hours, uh, which was really very rapid. Uh, Michael? We, Michael? 
Yes. It's uh, Neil Vander here. Can, can I go back to your uh, point about the nephrotoxicity? Please do. Um, you know, as a urologist, I have no experience with Lutathera, but my understanding is that nephrotoxicity is a concern, a significant concern there, and that uh, amino acid infusions are given along with that therapeutic. So my question is, why do you think it's uh, nephrotoxicity is more of an issue with a somatostatin two receptor targeted agent than with something like PSMA, where we know that there is a substantial amount of PSMA that's expressed in the in the proximal tubules, and yet we don't see much in the way of nephrotoxicity. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a really really good question. So there is PSMA expressed in proximal convoluted tubules. When we do a PSMA PET, we see really high kidney uptake. Uh, I think the same is true for dotate. There is some somatostatin receptor expression in the proximal convoluted at tubules. Uh, I think the method, my own opinion, and it's not based on any data, because unfortunately this hasn't actually been really well studied in a basic science level, but probably it should be, and maybe you know some data that I don't know, Neil, but I think that dotate is filtered, but uh, uh, and reabsorbed uh, so that it's cycling through the kidneys and therefore if you give an amino acid like lysine and arginine as we do in competition that you end up with a uh, lack of reabsorption and therefore you minimize renal dose considerably i think the method of excretion with psma is very different i think it's probably both filtered and secreted so you don't get that reabsorption so the renal excretion is much more rapid with psma since it's not being reabsorbed, uh, we we don't see that toxicity. And I don't think that lysine arginine helps with PSMA, whereas it does with uh, dotatate. So I think there's a fundamental difference in the way the kidneys are handling the PSMA um, a small molecule as opposed to the dotatate peptide. But I, I'm interested in your views on that, Neil, since you probably have some uh, more science to back up your answer. Well, I, I don't have any data with respect to uh, the somatostatin receptor and lutathera. I, we do have data that suggests that the uh, PSMA peptide is is not retained in the proximal tubules for very long. It's 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 internalized, but then um, uh, effluxes back out of the. Uh, um, of the proximal tubule cell relatively quickly. So th there, isn't a, there isn't a long duration of exposure there. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting, though. I think if we move towards alpha emitters, which we might come to at some point, uh, we might see more renal toxicity over time. We have a question from Matt Cooperberg. Uh, perhaps you can answer your question live, Matt, if you unmute yourself. Or maybe you're just oh, don't have a microphone and you can't actually ask your question. In which case, I'll ask your question. Oh no, go ahead, Matt. Here we go. Uh, I'm curious about the heterogeneity of the expression. If you have an opportunity to do any correlative, uh, either IHC or uh, PSMA, actually PSMA expression studies at the RNA level on biopsies from any of these tumors, uh, and whether whether you have the opportunity to correlate with with response. Yeah. So radiographic response. All men in this trial underwent. CT and bone scan every three months as per Prostate Cancer Working Group. Uh, so we will have radiologic uh, progression data and bone scan data. Uh, we actually did not do regular PSMA PET, so we do not have a PSMA PET response in these men. And we have not yet analysed that radiographic endpoint that's being uh, worked through at the moment. Uh, in terms of correlate, uh, we don't have really too many tumour specimens in this group, although... Uh, but we do have a translational component to the study. Ian, are you st are you? Do you want to comment on the translational aspects of of the therapy study? Yes, it's still a work in progress. We haven't done any of that work yet, except to collect the samples because we're waiting for clinical outcomes. But uh, 
Uh, we've got a, a number of people involved in the team uh, with expertise in circulating tumour DNA, assays, uh, markers of radio sensitivity and radio resistance. And so what we're hoping is that we might be able to identify a blood signature that would predict uh, which patients may or may not respond to this type of therapy. But that's still work to come. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Radiology User 1. What percentage of patients had FDG radiographic progression with or without PSA response on protocol? Uh, we don't know since FDG was a selection criteria but not used for response assessment in this trial. That would be really interesting. We have uh, embedded some more FDG for response assessment in our, in our next trials. Uh, I think it may be uh, useful. Uh, was metastatic biopsy performed and what was the percentage of enrolled patients with evidence of neuroendocrine disease? Uh, so uh, metastatic biopsy was not part of this study and uh, I think significant neuroendocrine component was an exclusion criteria for this study uh, but if you had a little bit that was okay as long as you had high PSMA uh, expression. Uh, another question, was genomic testing performed? Well, as Ian alluded to, we have uh, taken blood uh, for that in, in all the men. Uh, they've consented for that. Uh, we've done translational bloods that are currently in a freezer at, at baseline at 12 weeks and at time of progression. So I believe we have over 500 uh, sort of translational uh, samples to, to analyse in the future. Yeah, uh, genomic testing of tumour is not routinely done in Australia yet. It's, it's happening increasingly, but it's not yet routine. So some of these patients will have had um, genotyping of their cancer, but uh, not uh, that would be a minority. Uh, Declan, do you want to hand, uh, go through some questions for us? You're getting tired of the sound of your own voice, Michael, are you? Um, uh, it's very lovely. I might go back to the panel for a sec while we digest a few more questions and ask Cora if she has anything she'd like to bring in with her extensive experience of uh, cytotoxic therapies in this space. Um, Cora, any further comments from you? I, I just really want to compliment you on, on carrying out such a, an important study. And I think that also at Cornell, we're trying to do with Scott Tagawa some important work with uh, um, PSMA lutetium and with actinium, and uh, I, I see that patients are very eager to have these therapies, and I have to compliment the Australian group, all that you've done, and I think that it's the, uh, the knowledge is becoming more and more widespread, and I think our patients will all benefit from that. I mean, I think that chemotherapy is not going away so quickly, but I think that uh, from what I see from the toxicity, that you, you definitely have a favorable toxicity profile. I see Scott Tagawa online, so I thought I'd better promote him to panellists since he did a nice commentary on this uh, after the ASCO presentation. Scott, do you want to highlight any thoughts you have in when you analyse this for your uh, ASCO uh, commentary? Sorry to put you on the spot. You might actually not have a microphone available. Maybe not. We'll leave you there to... Uh, to uh, maybe unmute yourself if you can. There was a question on race, uh, whether we had uh, any data on responses uh, in regards to different race. Uh, we do, we, I don't think we really have that data point. This trial was conducted in Australia. We're quite a multicultural society, so there will be people from a variety of different uh, backgrounds, but I, I'm not aware that we've analysed that or have that data, but I think that will be important data to look at in the future. A question from Sana Gill, My, uh, Michael, when patients underwent both FDG and PSMA, PET was high radiation dose a consideration? Uh, I'm just trying to understand the question. I'm actually going to promote you to panellists, Sana, so that you can uh, enunciate that question for me if you can. Are, are you there online? Oh, so I think the question is about the radiation dose from the diagnostic imaging, uh, given that we're doing both PSMA and FTG PET scan, a concern just about having too many scans. Well, actually, a, a PSMA and FTG PET scan are each about half the dose of a contrast-enhanced CT with contrast. So doing both an FTG and PSMA PET would still be actually a lower dose than a single contrast-enhanced CT, believe it or not. 
Uh, so that's not of particular concern to me as a nuclear medicine specialist. And also, if the patients were treated with lutetium PSMA, they would have received a dose more than 10,000 times the the dose of these scans. Uh, and even just the regular CT bone scan every 12 weeks would far exceed the dose of the uh, PSMA and FDG PET. So I think it's important for those who aren't aware to know that we're really using extremely low doses of radiation when we perform our PET scanning. Now there's a question from Peter Olcott. I might promote you to the panel about external beam radiotherapy. And we haven't had much uh, radiation oncology input and uh, I think they're a key partner in this uh, type of research as well. Peter, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you. So um, <clears throat> I think this was Dr. Um, Weber. Um, on his slide, he was looking at combination therapies that were promising. And one of them was listed with external beam radiotherapy. And I was wondering um, what would be the rationale that you would think that external beam would, would help in these late stage cancer patients? Louise, do you want to comment on that? I think what was it? The question is it, about the role of external beam radiation as a combined treatment in these patients with late stage disease. Yeah. So um, I think Michael, you would agree that a lot of patients who are getting lutetium PSMA therapy some can sometimes can have phenotypes that progress during during the treatment and can become symptomatic. Sometimes that's just one site of disease and can be identified on the lutetium spect images. And uh, giving external beam radiotherapy to those single sites can be highly effective. Yeah, um, and certainly it can mean the patient can remain on uh, treatment, on the systemic treatment. Yeah, so I think in this study we excluded patients with, uh, you know, FDG discordant diseases and perhaps we shouldn't have done that. Perhaps they should have, could have received external beam radiation to those sites. The suggestion in the question is that it could be used for debulking larger tumours. I think that may be true. Uh, ablation to critical sites. Uh, so in this study, actually, you could have concurrent radiotherapy for palliative reasons. Uh, so for example, if you had ureteric obstruction from a retroperitoneal nodal mass, you could have radiotherapy to that site and continue on trial in either arm. Uh, and we'll have that data, so perhaps we can look at that in the paper, uh, whether that was actually uh, used or administered. Uh, and also for sites of bone pain, I think uh, supplementing R radiation with external beam radiation uh, actually makes uh, a lot of sense. Michael Anders Bartel is asking if you saw just as good a response in bone lesions as in soft tissue lesions. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we haven't looked at that in the therapy study specifically, uh, but we have looked at that in our uh, perhaps our phase two study. And our impression is actually that soft tissue lesions respond better than bone lesions. Uh, patients with nodal metastases, they often tend to regress sometimes completely and not come back. Even patients with uh, lung and adrenal metastases seem to have good responses and uh, we do see perhaps poorer responses in the liver and the main site of progression in this population is within bone uh, often at new sites of disease but also at existing sites uh, so I do see bone as the uh, troublesome site in this population of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer I think that's just the natural history of the disease uh, marrow is a very fertile soil for prostate cancer uh, next question, was individual dosimetry used for deciding lutetium PSMA therapy dose and what was the dose limiting organ? Uh, good question. So we did not do any dosimetry specifically in this study. They did have spec CT at 24 hours and some sites do that with quantitative spec CT. So we may be able to look at that uh, down the track as an exploratory endpoint. Uh, I don't think we identified any dose limiting organ uh, in this uh, study. Uh, but if you had to say what it is, it may be uh, actually may actually be if you kept increasing the dose uh, more and more and more, eventually I think marrow or hematologic toxicity, particularly thrombocytopenia, may actually be the rate limiting uh, dose. Uh, anyone from the panel want to make a comment? Uh, Michael, it's okay. Hey, Corey. I'm just wondering if you have ever treated patients that were not as highly selected as in this as in this study, patients without um, uh, that were not selected based on PSMA PET and FDG PET. We have not at our site at Peter Mac. I think uh, 
uh, Scott Tagawa, who's on the line, but perhaps muted and not having a microphone, has. Uh, our philosophy has really come from the neuroendocrine tumour world where we have treated patients with discordant disease and we invariably see that those sites of discordant disease do progress. That's not to say there isn't benefit in, in some men, particularly for quality of life. If you've got bone pain and some discordant disease, I think Letitia and PSMA would be a very effective agent for palliation. And Neil's got experience in treating a unselected population. Neil, would you like to make a comment? Yes, yeah, so um, all of our studies um, at Cornell, uh, PSMA-targeted studies, have have used an unselected population. And, and the primary reason for that is, again, all of our studies are phase one or phase two or, or phase two A studies. And we did not want to presuppose who was going to respond and who was not going to respond. Clearly there's a, a logic and a rationale to us. And there's now data to demonstrate that you're more likely to have a response if you have higher PSMA expression. But we wanted to get data um, across the full spectrum of uh, prostate cancer patients. Um, and when I say full spectrum, I mean patients with both high and low PSMA expression levels with the hope that we could uh, objectively define a threshold or a threshold area above which you are more likely to respond and below which you are not. Um, and, and it was apparent to us that the best way to do that was to treat mm -hmm. everybody and then look at the data and then define what that threshold was. We're, we're still working on that, even though um, it's been part of our uh, paradigm for 20 years or almost 20 years. Yeah, no, and in great. part, we're still working on that because it's really only since the advent of PET, which is just a few years now, that we've been able to look at uh, objective SUV data rather than sort of a, a one, two, or three plus. So we're, we're hoping we'll be able to get uh, that data and, and better define a, a threshold. Michael, w while, I'm, uh, while I have the mic here, let me go back, if you don't mind, to your uh, previous point about a bone versus lymph node. Uh, response and and it's it's interesting to me. Um, so you've reported and and you you just um, again repeated that you tend to see I think better responses in lymph nodes, and I think that uh, with with the small molecule agents, and I think that is something that's been observed by others, uh, particularly in Germany. I, I think Richard Baum has has reported data that's similar to that. On that note, I, I uh, just uh, escalated Richard Baum to the panellist, but I don't know if he's actually got a microphone and available to talk. So I think Richard Baum well, actually perhaps did the first lutetium PSMA therapy in the world, uh, and I'm interested in his perspectives on the therapy study. Are, are you there, Richard? Yes, I'm there. Good morning to Down Under. <laughs> <laughs> it's late in the evening here. Congratulations for such a fantastic uh, trial uh, with such an effort of many people and uh, now the first one as Wolfgang already mentioned to be a prospective randomized uh, trial. Uh, actually I would be interested if some of the patients uh, also received actinium 225 PSMA. Uh, actinium 225. Uh, not in this study. Uh, uh, everyone received lutetium only. I don't think it was available, uh, so no. But it's a is that uh, what? What's your perspective on actinium versus lutetium, Richard? I mean, uh, lutetium. There are a lot of data, and uh, from many centers confirming that it is an active agent. Uh, whereas for actinium, there are only few data. So we have. Uh, done in some patients uh, alpha uh, treatment after failure of the tissue treatment, showing uh, that some patients still have a very good response uh, with actinium 225 uh, or in combination even with the tissue, what we call tandem uh, therapy. So um, I think that's something we have to keep in mind that 
And some patients have different responses for different uh, radioisotopes. Yeah. I thought I'd just share a couple of slides with the audience, just a few what we have going now, some uh, studies uh, that we're running now. So the therapy trial is closed. Uh, we have two new trials, both run through the ANZUP group. One is called the Upfront PSMA trial, and this is a trial in patients with hormone-sensitive uh, large high-volume metastatic disease. Uh, so in patients with newly diagnosed disease, high-volume disease defined by PET, they undergo both an FDG and a PET, a PSMA PET CT, and they're randomised to either uh, lutetium PSMA followed by docetaxel uh, versus docetaxel with ADT given in both arms. Uh, so this study has commenced. We treated the first patient at Peter Mac uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this will open at uh, 12 sites around Australia. Uh, and we have two more trials. One is the ENZA-P trial. Uh, run by Louise Emmett in Sydney, randomising patients to enzalutamide plus lutetium PSMA uh, compared to uh, enzalutamide. Uh, this is a great trial. Uh, it includes a lot of PSMA and FDG PET, and this trial uh, is just about to open, also run by the ANZUP group. And we have a trial, at, a small trial at Peter Mac of 20 patients called the lutectomy trial. This is a Declan Murphy trial. Uh, we're taking patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, high-risk features, high PSMA expression, uh, we're giving them one or two cycles of lutetium PSMA 617 at a lower dose, 5 gigabecquerels, and then they're proceeding to prostatectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection. And our primary endpoint for that study is actually the absorbed radiation dose. Uh, so the question here is a bit uh, looking to the future, could lutetium PSMA be used really instead of external beam radiotherapy or as a supplement to it? Uh, uh, so that's just some of the work we are uh, doing it, Peter Mac. Philippe uh, is on the line from Sao Paulo. He was one of our fellows, and he had a question that was the next most highest voted question. So I might ask you to ask your question, Philippe. Or maybe you cannot. Maybe you don't have a microphone. Let me move back and see if I can find it. Uh, what is impression of clinical oncologists concerning the next line of therapy when progression happens to occur. Were they able to give more chemotherapy? Is medullary function significantly uh, affected? Uh, Ian, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, this is, <coughs> this is an excellent point. So the concern was whether the lutetium would compromise our ability to give cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, we don't have all the information we need to be able to answer that question properly, but... Uh, really the, the, the nature of the men entering therapy was that a decision had already been made uh, between them and their treating oncologist that the most appropriate next line of therapy for them would be cabazitaxel. They'd already had docetaxel, 90% uh, or so had already had abiraterone or enzalutamide. You can only get one of those in Australia. And so cabazitaxel was the next setting. So for men on lutetium, if they were fit, cabazitaxel was the next logical line of therapy and those who were fit would have gone on to do that. There were a few patients in the cabazitaxel arm who crossed over to receive lutetium um, on a compassionate use basis. It's been uh, provided by some private providers in Australia. Uh, so there were some sequencing questions there, but that was only a small number of patients. But really, cabazitaxel was the only life prolonging therapy uh, left for, the, for these men at that point. And other options would have included dexamethasone and, and of course, supportive care. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with all those points. But I think it is feasible to give uh, cabazitaxel following lutetium. Uh, that's not a particular problem. Question from Andy Simmons. Was there any relationship between PSMA expression and change in PSA? Uh, not, not specifically looked at in this therapy trial, uh, but as alluded to previously, uh, we definitely see a dosimetry relationship. So patients with higher PSMA uptake on a PET scan definitely have a higher likelihood of having a drop in PSA. And, uh, and there is a, uh, at least a correlation with overall survival in that data as well. Uh, there's a question from Carlos Dzik. I have treated five patients in Brazil and Chile and an impression that lutetium PSMA changes the behaviour of the disease thereafter, turns it into a more indolent disease. Does this make sense? I would like to think so, but I, I'm not sure I agree. I think uh, at least on the therapy study, 
and my experience in this population, unfortunately, is that this is quite an aggressive disease. And in this castration-resistant population, when you uh, uh, progress, you often progress with a very aggressive phenotype and your survival is, is poor. So I wonder if your experience with lutetium PSMA is a little bit earlier on when the natural history is more indolent. Uh, but I, I, I don't think we succeed in changing this into an indolent phenotype. It's a question from David Wise. Michael, can you talk a bit more about defects in DNA repair damage and whether any correlation between BRCA2 ATM and other HRD defects and response? Now, this is an area of immense interest. There was some, uh, some interesting data from uh, the De Bono group recently and also some interesting data from the Heidelberg group in, uh, in Germany. I think there's actually some conflicting uh, data on this question. Some data suggests that BRCA2 patients are very or ATM are very radiosensitive and therefore will do well with lutetium. Uh, there's some more recent data suggesting, in fact, that they just have an aggressive phenotype and their natural history is poor and that they do worse. Uh, so my bias is to think that patients with DNA repair mutations may be radiosensitive, uh, but my observation is actually that uh, some of these patients have a very aggressive phenotype and do actually very poorly. They may uh, respond quickly, but then they progress just as quickly I can see Wolfgang nodding his head. So do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, it, it has also been our experience that uh, we've seen more patients, I think, that had a poor response where we have data that they have um, DNA, uh, DNA repair uh, defects. So yeah. it, I don't think it's so simple to say if you have a DNA repair defect, you respond better to this treatment. We do have a study open at Peter Mac, funded by the Prostate Cancer Foundation by a Challenge Award uh, run by Shanine Sandu, our oncologist, and myself, uh, called the LUPARP trial, where we are combining lutetium PSMA 617 with uh, olaparib, a phase one study where we dose escalate the olaparib from 50 milligrams to a full dose where, you know, up to, I think, 150 milligrams on our dose escalation, and patients have a two-week course of olaparib uh, commencing one day after each cycle of lutetium PSMA and that trial's recruiting well. It's also uh, opened in Sydney uh, with Louise Emmett and uh, uh, you know we hope to have recruitment finished by the end of this year. Uh, so we'll get some data on that combination and that was open to all men, not just men with uh, BRCA mutations, but they've all had genetic analysis. So we'll have uh, some data on, uh, on that subgroup of patients. 7.23 in Melbourne. We're going to go for another seven minutes till 7.30. Declan's actually left the room. Uh, Euro Oncology MDT starts at 7.30 in the morning and uh, he's gone off to prepare for that. So he's left me in charge of his podcast machinery, which is quite scary. Uh, so hopefully the audio continues uh, uh, to work uh, smoothly. Uh, question, why do we need to complicate and give various names and terms to nuclear medicine therapeutic procedures? Uh, why don't we just keep it simple and call it radionuclide therapy like thyroid cancer? Yeah, I think that's not a bad suggestion. What's your preferred term, Wolfgang? Um, I don't know. I was <laughs> I couldn't make up my mind with this first question. I think there are really pros and cons for all of them. I think Theranostics is a good name, though. Yeah, I like Theranostics because it encompasses both the imaging and therapy, whereas radionuclide therapy, we're just doing a therapy the same with perhaps molecular targeted therapy. But we are really selecting patients using PET, both with iodine right. or dotatate or PSMA, and just to encapsulate the fact that we both do imaging and therapy. It's the really unique feature of what we do compared to any other treatment on the planet is that we can uh, see what we treat. Question from Eric Paljian. Is there a correlation between PSMA-positive uptake by imaging cells and PSMA-positive expression on circulating prostate cancer cells? I don't know the answer to that. It's a very good answer. We may have that data because we have, we will do some circulating tumor uh, DNA or RNA analysis uh, from our translational specimens. Uh, and how um, Louise, em Louise Emmett's study will be collecting circulating tumor cells as well. Yeah, so uh, it may well be that that's useful. Uh, we have some data in the melanoma world uh, around circulating tumor DNA and correlating it with metabolic tumor volumes on PSMA PET scans. And there is some correlation, but it does seem that they are telling you fundamentally uh, two different things. Richard Baum asked a good question. How many patients received less than six cycles of lutetium PSMA therapy? And uh, I can probably answer that question offline. I do have that uh, data. I just don't have it in front of me and it wasn't reported in the ESCO uh, slides. 
Uh, is there a low incidence of side effects conducive to a lutetium PSMA dose escalation uh, from Reina Harnadez? I think that's a very good question. Uh, we've used uh, doses in this study and don't see any dose-limiting toxicity. So why do we only give uh, 7.5 gigabecrols? Could we give more? Uh, Neil Bander and... Uh, and Scott Tagawa have done a dose escalation study where they've given 15 gigabecrels in two doses uh, closely together, two weeks apart, and still, I understand, did not reach a rate-limiting uh, toxicity. But I think it's important to bear in mind that the uh, toxicities are often delayed. So if we think about renal toxicity, uh, that'll come a year down the track or even perhaps myelodysplasia. So the risk with giving higher doses is you may not see an acute toxicity but the side effects from radiation are often six months, nine months down the track, and uh, it may occur, you know, down the track. Uh, so we do need to be careful. There are a whole bunch of other questions that we haven't answered, 36 questions, and we will file these away. We may have an offline discussion about this. Uh, for those that weren't able to watch this, we will uh, have a recorded version and uh, put that live on uh, on a link for people to watch and perhaps engage in a question and answer afterwards. I might circle back to to Howard to have the last word, as always, uh, in the last two or three minutes uh, remaining. I think we did peak at around 370 people or th 370 participants online at the same time, uh, which is quite remarkable. And we still have 200 participants online, so we could keep going. No, it's great. This was um, – thank, thank you, Michael Hoffman. Declan Murphy and all the panelists and all the participants. Uh, we, we are very invested in this technology. We think it is one of the future arms of, of prostate cancer therapy. And we're just so pleased with the process being made uh, in Melbourne, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Munich, really globally. So thank you very much. And thank you to the hundreds of participants from how many countries? 30. 40, 45. Countries we have? 45 countries. Um, that's, that's quite remarkable that the depth of interest is so, so global. So this is great. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the podcast room at some point in the near future. Don't quite know when that will be yet with our current mm -hmm. travel situation, but everybody stay safe, stay healthy and, um, and thank you for everything that you do, Michael. No, thank you, Howard. And I might end, we have a banner behind us and people may not have heard of uh, Prostic, but later today we have a, a launch at Peter Mac of a, a Prostate Cancer Theranostics and Imaging Centre of Excellence uh, to accelerate this research. And this is from a really generous donation from the uh, US Prostate Cancer Foundation to, to uh, further accelerate our research. So we, we'll have Howard back uh, virtually in our hospital in a few hours' time. So we... Uh, eagerly await that but really uh, thank all the panel members Ian, Cora, uh, Wolfgang it's uh, 10, 11 30 at night in Germany and he's not even in his pajamas so we really thank you for staying up late uh, thank those who joined the panel uh, apologies to those who asked questions that we uh, didn't get to but we do actually have those questions recorded so we'll uh, maybe try to get through those offline and we'll let everyone either uh, go to bed or get on with the rest of their day thank you so much it's been a fantastic uh, session Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.